investment regret because here's why. What's it going to do for me? It's not going to bring me $260 per share saying, I regret it. Can you reverse it? Okay. But here's the bigger reason. It is poison in investing to keep thinking about things you should have done or shouldn't have done. Because here's how it will play out. Let's suppose I let this seep into my head. And I have Uber in my portfolio that I bought at 27. It's now at 36, and it goes to 45 or 50. And I get to a point where Uber looks overvalued. And I get ready to sell it, and I remember by Tesla regret. You know what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to end up holding on to Uber for too long. I know it sounds weird, but you know, you've got to let things that have happened. It's not easy to do. I'm saying that if you don't do it, it'll hurt you. And if, this is not about the past, this is about the future. And you remember the old saying on Wall Street, right? You can be a bull, you can be a bear, don't be a pig. And what they mean is if you get greedy, you can take everything you made and lost it. So I'm perfectly OK with 640. Maybe if it goes to $6,000 per share. Not only will I regret selling, I'll have regret not putting all my money in Tesla and just retiring after it goes to 6000 Second, I was looking at your orphan list. There are a lot of orphans in this class. It's like, I mean, Oliver Twist kept playing in my head, right? May I have some more porridge? If you have no idea what I'm talking about, maybe you should go back and read Oliver Twist. They're like 15 orphans. This is good news. 15 orphans is three groups. Orphan group one, orphan group two, orphan. My suggestion is if you're in the orphan group, reach out to the other orphans. Start to put, put the group together. Finally, I know by now you're not reading my emails. You know why? Because I see a lot of you looking for these slides in your packets, and you're not seeing them. You know why, too, right? I sent it out too late. I sent it out this morning. You don't have to have it. Basically, you don't need the slides ahead of time. It's all, as a PDF file, you can get on the back. But on Tuesday, I sent you my first valuation of the week, because you might as well stay current. It's, of course, the valuation of Tesla. Okay. And many of you are saying, no, I'm not ready yet. You will never be ready to value Tesla, right? because it's always going to be just out of your reach. But when you open the spreadsheet, it's a little intimidating. All these worksheets and things, there are only three numbers on that spreadsheet that drive that valuation. The first is your revenue growth rate. Okay. Right now, how much revenue does Tesla have? About 25 billion, roughly speaking, trailing 12 months. In my valuation, what was, does anybody check to see what my revenues were in year 10? About 125 billion. Let's think of it in terms of cars, right? That will translate into about 2 million to 2.5 million cars. Is that plausible in the auto market? Absolutely. You know how many cars were sold globally last year? 78 million. Volkswagen alone sold 9 million. That's like 2.5 million. I mean, that's reachable, right? You think, where do you come up with these numbers? I use this really deep research process called Google search. So much of the data is at half fingertips. I don't know. We have no excuse anymore, right? We can look it up. Of course, you don't believe everything on Google search, especially if it comes from my site, so don't trust any of the market. But two and a half million. So when you think about revenue growth, rather than, because I use, I think, 25%, don't think 28 30%. Look at the end revenues. What's the question I'm asking you? Could Tesla be Volkswagen-like, in which case its revenues could be 250 billion? Or is it going to end up being Audi, BMW-like, in which case its revenues are going to be 80 billion? Or maybe you think Tesla is going to have side business that allow you to have even more. So first question, when you think about revenue growth, the question I'm asking is, in 10 years, what kind of revenues did you get? Okay. In fact, I'm you've seen, you've ever, have you ever gone to a Build-A-Bear store in a mall? It's a freaky little place. And usually you don't go in there if you're a grown-up, unless you're really strange. You go in there when you're a seven-year-old, and they give you this piece of skin to stuff. And 30 <laughs> minutes later, you have the ugliest bear ever known to man. And then they pull this really sneaky trick. They say, you don't have to buy the bear, but if you do, it'll cost you $75. You've got your seven-year-old next to you who's concocted this, this Frankenstein bear. There's no way you're leaving the store. I'm going to do a build your own valuation of Tesla. I have a long flight back this evening. This is how I keep myself occupied. Where I'm going to let you pick, OK. Now, who am I to say that 125 billion? Maybe you think it's going to be Volkswagen-like or even bigger. So in your mind, pick a number. 100 billion, 200 billion, 300 billion. Got it? 
Second big input is what kind of operating margin will Tesla earn once it gets past the pain? Because right now, its margins are really low. It used to lose money. In fact, it just started to make money. The margin I used was 12%. Again, perspective. The, auto, the median margin for an automobile company is about 6%. So already, you're at the 80th, maybe 90th percentile. But the margin for technology companies, especially software companies, is 20 25%. The margin for Apple is 30%. So the question I'm asking is, what kind of margins do you think Tesla will earn? Will it earn auto company-like margins, tech company-like margins? Or do you think the Tesla 5, 6, 7, whatever it is, will be like an iPhone, where they can make 30% margins? So pick one. You didn't think valuation was this subjective, right? Welcome to valuation. Pick the number. I pick 12. You can pick 6 if you think it's an auto company. You, pick, you can pick 30 if you think it's Apple like. Or you can pick 20 if you want to give it a tech company. Second big input. The third big input is this number that says sales to capital. You say, what the hell is that? That measures how much you will have to invest to get that revenue growth. Because remember, to go from 600,000 cars to 2 million cars, you've got to build assembly lines. The question I'm asking is, how much will it cost you to build these assembly lines? Again, perspective. Typical automobile company, a sales to cap ratio is about 1.5. For every mil million dollars you invest, you get a million and a half in revenues. Typical tech company, that's closer to three. And if you're a company like Uber, which has no capital intensity at all, it could be four or five. You ready? Pick a number. Do you think it has to invest like auto companies, build assembly lines? Or maybe your story is they're going to make more revenues through software. I don't even know how this would work. Well, if you don't own a Tesla, will you download the auto software? Will it work on a different car? In which case, you might be able to grow the revenues with much less. So the higher that number, the less they will have to reinvest to get from where they are now to where they need to be. So let's suppose you decide that you want to go Volkswagen-like on revenues. Apple-like on margins, and Uber-like on in investment. I'll save you the trouble. Tesla is worth about $5,000 per share. This is the arc. You've heard of arc, the, you know, Kathy Wood. This is the arc scenario. But when I see that, I'm reminded of the first Toy Story movie. You see that movie? There's this mean kid called Sid who Sid lives next door. And you know what he does? He takes apart toys. And he reconnects them. So you take the head of a, you know, I, I don't know, a doll and put it on top of a GI Joe and give it the legs of a dinosaur. That's pretty much what you've done, right? You've taken Volkswagen-like revenues. But remember, when you give it Apple-like margins, how much revenue did Apple have last year? Less than 100 billion. That's why their margins can be so high. Is they're, you know, basically, they sell at this high price relative to their cost. So when you give Apple margins to Volkswagen revenues and you say, hey, they don't invest like Uber, if you can live with that story, hey, it's your money. It's not my money. And you think it's worth 5000 So one of the reasons I want to do this story is, look, I'm tired of people saying, well, why can't we have $300 billion in revenues? Why can't you give them 10% market share? People throw numbers around on individual items. One of the pieces and say, why? yeah, they could have revenues of 300 billion, but that can't go with the 10 or 12, 15% margins. You need to get the value. You have to pick stories that gel together. And one of the things we're going to talk about is how, when you create valuation, you have to fight the temptation to pick individual line items and play with them. Push up the revenue growth, holding all. You can't hold all else constant. This is a business. If they want to sell more cars and price them at $25,000 a car, hey, all the more part of them, but don't tell me you're going to make 20% margins on a $25,000 car. There is no way you can with the manufacturing costs involved. So play with the Tesla valuation. Go into the Google shared spreadsheet. I've made it an open spreadsheet, which means it's not just people in the class. You know, let's see how we can get to 10,000, 5,000. This is like a crowd valuation. You know? So let's, let's, let's get the process going. So give it your best shot. You know? Make it, as I said, don't get too caught up in the spreadsheet itself for the moment, because we'll come back and deal with the details. Focus on those three numbers. So today's session, I want to talk about, I'm going to start by talking about what I think is the biggest single impediment to good valuation. 
It's the preconceptions and biases you bring into evaluation. Remember I've been nagging you to pick a company? Anybody picked a company yet? Come on, I, you know, who did you pick? It doesn't matter. Or just tell me, what, it's a local company where? In Dubai. Dubai. Okay, why did you pick it? Uh, because they're not listed, but at the same time, people are actually selling and buying them in, in crazy prices at the same time. Mm -hmm. People are saying it's overvalued, undervalued. Okay. And so you're a lot of uncertainty about it, and so you're curious, so you're picking the company because it's... Anybody else picked a company yet? Who did you pick? Beyond Meat. Beyond Meat. Why did you pick Beyond Meat? They're vegan? No, okay. No, so that could be a reason, right? You're a vegan, you want the vegans to take over the world. Beyond Meat is your frontal assault weapon, right? So you pick Beyond Meat, why? Uh, I thought it was interesting. And what made it interesting? Uh, that I read that it was money value. You know, Beyond Meat went public at 45. This is March or April of last year. By September, it was trading at 240. Let's face it, that's the interest. Nobody would be writing about Beyond Meat if all you had was Jack in the Box burgers they're eating, which are Beyond Meat burgers. It's a fact that the price shot up, and it's difficult to explain. None of us picks a company on a blank slate. When you pick a company, you already are bringing in priors and preconceptions about the company. In fact, think of the two pieces of advice you're given when you, ask, when you sit down to value a company. Go collect as much information as you can about the company. Read what other people have written about the company. That is deadly. And I'll make a confession. I have biased your Tesla valuation by doing what? By telling you my value. So as you read what other people think about the company, whether you like it or not, it's starting to affect, even before you put the first number down, what you think about the company. You're also asked to meet the management of the company, this is especially if you start to become an equity research analyst and you meet them. Now, this is even more deadly. Let's say you meet the CEO and you like the person. Worse still, you decide to play golf this weekend with the CEO. All is lost. Or you meet the person. You absolutely hate the person. He's a jerk. Hey, guess what? It's going to start to affect evaluation. I'll give you a personal example of how bias contaminates valuations. I have valued Microsoft every year since 1986, the year of their IPO. Every single year between 1986 and 2015, I'll tell you what happened in 2015 changed my views. I found Microsoft to be overvalued. You name the price, overvalued, $2, $4, don't buy, don't buy, don't buy. Strange, right? One of the great success stories of US equity markets. I wouldn't have touched it one step of the way. You're probably saying, I could give you access to every single spread valuation I've done of Microsoft. The first one was a Lotus spreadsheet because there was no Excel yet. And you could dig through the spreadsheets looking for clues, but you'd be looking in the wrong place. If you really want to know why I found Microsoft to be overvalued, all you need to do is go over to the next building, go up the ninth floor, go to 969, my office. The door's actually open. Open the door. Don't steal anything, please. Walk in and look around. You know what you're going to be surrounded by? Apples. Not fruits, but the apple. I've been an Apple user since 1982. In fact, in my office, I still have my Mac 128K. For those of you who don't know, that was the first box Mac. It came without a hard drive. Yet to, to me, Microsoft has always been the Darth Vader of technology. For those of you who are Star Wars fans, let me be specific. I'm not talking Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader, but da Episodes 4, 5, 6, Darth Vader. <laughs> I have a lot of bad thoughts about Bill Gates, and they all come bubbling up to the surface when I sit down to value Microsoft. High growth or low growth? Who'd buy this rotten product? Low growth. High risk or low risk? One virus away from blowing up high risk. By the time I make my choices, my destination is already pre-picked. You know what that tells me? I'm far too biased to value Microsoft. So I never act on my valuations. You know who else I'm far too biased to value then? I've given it. It's Apple. Why? Because I love the company too much. In fact, if you go to my blog, my first valuation of Apple was in 2010. I valued it pretty much every year since. And I spent half the post telling people, don't trust me. I love this company too much. And you know what? That's all I can do 
is I find it weird when somebody says, I am completely objective. How the heck can you say, I, look, I don't have any preconceptions? You say, what happened in 2015? I actually started to feel sorry for Microsoft. This was when Apple at the peak of its glory. Microsoft was this aging company's windows and office. It would seem to be on its walkway to doom. I actually started, it, it's tough to hate something that you feel sorry for. I bought Microsoft because I felt sorry, and it's become the best investment in my portfolio for the last six years because then they found the cloud, and you know the, you know the rest of the story. We make money for all the wrong reasons, but I'm not complaining. So if you think about what drives these biases, and you're saying, I'm going to control them, here's why it's so difficult to control. The first is, it's subconscious. When you sit down to value my uh, Tesla, you're not saying, look, the value that he got was 427. It's in there, right? It's, in fact, when you value your the company you picked, there's a number out there that's going to keep weaseling its way into your thought process. And what's that number? You value beyond, you sit down to value beyond meat. What's a number out there that's, that's kind of, it's like the elephant in the room. You're trying to ignore it, but it is a, the current market price. You can say, oh, I'm, not, I'm not going to look at it, but it doesn't matter. If you value Tesla today, there is no way on God's good earth that you can say, I am ignoring the $900 per share completely when I do the valuation because it's out there. Now, I you know sometimes you know, I get calls from, you know, old enough now that students of mine have not just risen up the ranks, they've retired. And you know, some are managing directors of investment banking teams, and they want me to come in and talk to their teams about how to do valuation better. And I tell them, look, I don't need to come in, but stop giving your team suggestions about what something should be priced at when you give them an assignment. So I say, so you're my IPO team. I'm the managing director. I give you the company and say, go you know, go put a value on the company, and by the way, I think 25 to 30 is about what <laughs> I think it's worth. And then you walk out of the room, guess what you get? 25 to 30. In fact, about eight years ago, I ran an experiment where I took, I was teaching two sections of valuation, and I gave the same IPO prospect to both, both sessions, and one session, I added an afterthought. I said, ignore this completely, but bankers think the offering price should be about 18 to $20. And the other group, I did not mention it. And then when the results came back, I showed the results you got in each group. And the group where I mentioned the 18 to 20, the peak of the distribution is right there, 18 to 20. The second is the, you know, the, 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 the power of money. Let's face it, most of you, if you choose to do valuation after your MBA, are doing it because it's part of your job. You're an M&A banker, you're an equity research analyst. And you're being paid to do the valuation. You tell me who pays you and how much you get paid. I'll tell you which direction the bias is and how much the bias is. I'll give you a very simple example to illustrate it. But 25 years ago, the company called Lynn Cable. And AT&T had an option to buy 49% of Lynn Cable at an appraised value. Lynn Cable is a publicly traded company, but the option was written in terms of appraised value. So the time for the option to be exercised comes about. AT&T goes out and hires Morgan Stanley. So you guys are going to be Morgan Stanley. You work for AT&T. You're going to appraise the value of Lynn so AT&T can buy the 49%. Lynn Cable goes out and hires Lehman Brothers. I'm sorry to do this to you, but think of yourselves as pre-bankrupt Lehman Brothers. And your job is to sell the value of the same 49% so you can sell it. Two investment banking teams go to work. And they come back with two very different numbers. One comes back with $105 per share. The other comes back with $155 per share. So I'm going to ask you to guess which group came back with $105 per share. And why? You work for the buyer. Your job is to come in with a low ball number. You probably have this 50-page valuation document to back it up with assumptions. And you did your job because your job was the seller was to come up with a high number. In fact, the difference was so large, they decided to call in a third investment banker. Why settle for two fees when you can have three, I guess? <laughs> and they call in this outfit called Wasserstein Perella. Now, I'm going to say something incredibly harsh about these guys, but I mean every word of it. These guys couldn't value a $20 bill in a brown paper bag if you put it in front of them. 
Then invent a multiple. Enterprise value to cash in the bag, 3.3. Next thing you know, you'll be paying $66 for a $20 bill. <laughs> but if you're Wasserstein Perella, you're right in the middle here, right? You don't want to piss off either side too much because you have to, you have to work with both sides in the future. 105, 155, where's the safest place for you to be? They came back with $127.50. <laughs> I'm going to let you in on a little secret in valuation. If you're asked to value something, never ever come back with a nice round number. Don't tell me the target price is 40. Tell me it's $38.87. It's amazing what that second decimal point will do in terms of creating an intimidation factor. I'm not asking this guy. He's got the second decimal point nailed down. <laughs> When in doubt, add decimals. <laughs> the power of money is overwhelming. And there are some processes that are so incredibly biased that you might as well not do valuation. You've already made up your mind. Why are we doing this kabuki dance of acting like you're estimating cash flows in a discount rate when I know exactly where you're going at the end of this process? You think, how would I bring bias in? I actually did a session once for the CFA on how to bias your valuation. And for the CFA, this is not a good topic because the CFA likes to maintain the illusion that they're objective. If you date a CFA, you're going to be a scientist. Complete lie because you're a human being and you're getting paid. So I took them through, hey, here are some of the things you can do to bias your valuation. You want to make your value higher. Well, in the case of Tesla, you want to have, use bigger market shares, higher margins, lower reinvestment. That'll make your cash flows higher. You want to make your value higher, you want to make your discount rate lower. So you make the risk premium smaller, use a lower beta. If you can switch to a different currency and use a Swiss franc risk-free rate, you're going to pull off that ploy and hope nobody notices. So basically, if you give me a company and say, can you triple the value of the company? The answer is absolutely. Whether I actually put my own money behind it is a different question. But biasing valuations is not difficult. One of the tools you will get out of this class, and I'm not, it's not a tool I'm proud of delivering to you, is you can make a valuation dance to your tune and hide your biases in a way that people will not find out. That's what often happens. People are good at valuation versus people are not, is people are good at valuation can hide their biases away. So, Valuations can be biased. And if you say, well, if I, do, if I price companies, will the bias go away? No, you pick a multiple. You pick the comparables. You, and then when you get to this point, you're going to see if you pick PE ratios, you might get a lower number. You know what you're going to do? You're going to try EV to EBITDA multiples. Maybe it'll give you a higher number. You pick US companies, you get a lower number, so I'll go global. Of course, I don't see all of this sausage being made. All you deliver is this neat, neat final project. Oh, this is the multiple. These are the comparables. This is my pricing. The reality again, bias is embedded in that. So you ready? We're going to try a few experiments on detecting bias. You're an entrepreneur. You've started up this company, lots of promise, and you're valuing a company for a venture capital round. You're coming up with a number for your company. It's really pricing your company because often you, that's all you do. Is your bias to come up with a high number or a low number if you're the owner entrepreneur? High number. And how are you going to do this? Often the way you price young companies is you pr there's nothing there right now, right? So you can't apply any multiples. So you project out a number that you hope is positive in the future. It might be only revenues. So my revenues in year three will be 100 million. Then you slap a multiple on this. It typically companies that are growing this fast rate at five times revenues. 100 times five is 500 million. That's the pricing of my company. So if you're the owner, you try to make your revenues in year three higher. You try to apply a higher multiple, and since you have to bring it all back to today, you use a lower discount rate to bring it in to deliver a higher price. Why? Not because you're unethical, but your assessment as an owner is to come up with a high price. Now, let's say I'm a venture capitalist looking at your company. You know why the pricing matters, right? How does a venture capital transaction work? You come to me and you think Shark Tank, right? You raise money from me. In return, what do I get? a percentage of your company. What percentage? That depends on the pricing I attach to your company. So don't try any Kevin O'Leary stuff and do royalties and stuff. Let's put, let's put that to the side. Okay? If you're a venture capitalist, is your bias to push down the pricing of the company or push it up? 
push it down. How am I going to do that? When you say 100 million revenue, you say, that's unrealistic. Let's make it 50. You say five times revenue, eh, that sounds too high. Companies like yours, it's three times revenues. And here comes my final weapon. After I get 150 million year five, what do I do to bring it back today? I make up a number called a target rate. You seen what venture capitalists charge for young companies? 40%, 50%, they're complete lies. They're not discount rates, because no venture capitalist ever makes 40% returns if you look at their overall investment. In fact, venture capital returns, if you go to the Cambridge Associates, they track them, they only drop about 14% a year, that's what. So you're saying, what is this 40, 50, 60? It's a negotiating tool, because if I discount 150 million at 60%, I come up with 60 million, and you know what I say? Look, I, you should give me 100% of your company. Again, it's not because the venture capitalist is, is being unethical, but because they have bias. Now let's make this personal. Let's suppose you get married, <laughs> you build a business, and then you get divorced. And your soon-to-be ex-spouse is going to get half your business. So the court says, how much is your business worth? What's your answer? It's worth nothing. I don't build good businesses, I'm a terrible manager. <laughs> if you think this is outlandish, there's a guy called Henry Ham, I'm not making up his name, is a Texas oilman who built this big oil business. It's a private business. He got divorced and his wife wanted half the business and he said, oh, this is a terrible business. I don't even know how to manage oil companies. I've ruined the company, it's worth nothing. Right? You want to come up with the low value and everything you do will be to deliver the low value. And if you're in a, so if you're, let, let's switch sides. So you go from divorce court to tax court. You're valuing your business now because somebody's going to ask you to pay taxes on the value of the business. Why it's, you know, it's part of your estate, it's part of, you know, some wealth tax, whatever they decide to do. What's your bias to come up with a low value and pay 20% of it or a high value? You're saying, I'm socially conscious, I will give a high value because I want to pay my fair share of society. Well, good luck to you on that one. <laughs> it's your objective to make the pricing lower because you want to pay less. Do you know that 80% of private company valuations are for tax court and divorce court? Do you know what often happens in private company valuations? There's a heck of a lot of discounting that seems to happen after you come up with the number. Come with the number, let's discount to 30%. Why small company? Another 20%, a company specific discount. Another 20%, private company. Now you're getting desperate. You can't even name the discount anymore. Your end game is zero. <laughs> and you want to get as close as you can? And even the appraiser for the IRS valuing the same business, you want to come up with a high number? I sometimes have these mixed audiences. Where, you know, two years ago, I was asked to come and talk to utility company CEOs and regulators. They brought them all into the same room. And for those of you who know how utility companies in the US work, they're regulated. And the reason they're regulated is your monopolies. And the way this plays out is a power company can't set prices for power completely freely. You have to go to a regulatory authority and say, allow me to earn a fair cost of equity. And let me set the pricing to earn it. So let's play a game. This half of the class be utility CEOs. This half of the class be the regulators who are going to determine how much power is going to be priced at. So I'm, I have to give you a price increase that's enough for you to earn a fair cost of equity. How do we compute cost of equity? We start with the risk-free rate, and then we come up with some relative risk measure, whether it's a beta. Then we do an equity risk premium. So what's your objective as CEO? Show a high cost of equity or a low cost of equity? You want a high cost of equity because then you can go to the regulator and say, look, I'm not making enough to cover my 15% cost of equity. You need, me to, you need to allow me to charge more for power. And of course, if you're the regulator, say, no, 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 it's 8%. You know how many ties I have to break where people say, I'll get call, uh, emails from both sides saying, no, I've used your, they use my website to back up their numbers, selectively picking numbers. I used your website to come up with 15%. The regulator is not allowing me to get away with it. Can you email the regulator? <laughs> this is pro bono intermediation that I don't want to do. And the same day, I'll often get a regulator saying, I used your website 
to come up with an 8% cost of equity, and they don't believe me. Can you let the company know that? I said, look, this is between you guys. I, why are you calling me in? This is a bias process, and that's exactly how it will play out. Let's talk about equity research. You decide to become a sell-side equity research analyst. You know how equity research is structured, in the, in, at least in the US. You got sell-side equity research. These are the people who work at the investment banks. These are the people you see on, on the Wall, in, in the Wall Street Journal and CNBC. They're called sell-side. Why? Because the bulk of the job is selling. That's the reality. You're selling your research ideas to clients, to portfolio managers. But the way it's structured is it's structured around you're given 15 companies. So if you're the I was going to say retail analyst, but it's just Amazon and everybody else going bankrupt. So let's pick something. Let's say the steel analyst. You're given 12 steel companies, and your job for the rest of your life, think about that while it gets you depressed, is to track these 12 steel companies. And do what? Every few weeks or months, you put out a recommendation. Buy these companies, sell these companies. So that should be pretty unbiased, right? Because you're doing it for your clients or portfolio managers, and you're hoping that your recommendations look, work out over time. So is there any bias you think in sell-side equity research? You know there are nine times as many buy recommendations as sell recommendations. It used to be 20 times, pre-2001 and Elliott Spitzer changes. Nine times, nine times as many buy recommendations. Why do you think that is? Why are equity research analysts so much more reluctant to say sell than buy? I'm sorry, what? In fact, this, you're burning your sources, right? That's basically what it is. It's like a journalist writing a terrible story about a politician who's been feeding that journalist information. Don't expect that politician ever. That's, I mean, if you think about it, we will talk a little bit more about sell side equity research. I know the SEC has restrictions on revealing information specifically, but you get a little hints from the company. And the minute you issue a sell recommendation, that access gets cut off. The bias in sell-side equity research is to push value up because you've got to justify the price. It's easier to put a buy than a sell. Of course, you have the squeezy buy, small, strong buy to weak buy. If you ever follow equity research and the analyst says, I've gone from a strong buy to a weak buy, you know what he's desperately trying to sell you, right? tell you, right? To sell the damn thing, but I can't say the word sell. So when you see numerical systems for stocks, you got one through five, it lower the stock from one to two. It's a very slimy way of saying sell without ever saying sell. So let's say you quit sell side equity research because you find it too biased. You become a buy side equity research analyst. Yesterday I was at Fidelity in Boston, and every, every year I visit them for a day, kind of basically be a shit disturber. And um, I talked to the buy side analyst at Fidelity. So if you're a buy side analyst at Fidelity, how does it work? You value companies no longer for outsiders, but for internal managers. So let's see if there's some bias in this process. I am a Fidelity manager who owns Tesla in my portfolio. I have a million shares of Tesla. And I say, look, I want an honest assessment of what Tesla is worth. So just, just be honest and objective. And you come back and tell me, do you think there might be a bias? What's the news that's going to make me happy? I'll take you out to dinner at the most expensive restaurant in Boston after that. It's not that you tell me that Tesla is overvalued. It's that you confirm that what I'm doing is the right thing. So your bias is, hey, I'll find Tesla to be undervalued. And if that same sell side, and Spidarity is not allowed to sell short, but if they had a you know, hedge fund that they ran where they sold short on Tesla and you were asked to value Tesla, well, the answer you should come back with, it's worth nothing. You're right, you should sell short. And finally, let's talk about the most contaminated process in valuation. It's m and I don't even know why people do valuation in M&A. You know the value of target companies? Whatever you decide to pay plus $10. I'm going to get there sooner or later. And the reason is very simple. Think of what, what causes the bias in the process. You're a banker. Play the role of an M&A banker. So you've got the right, you, know, you come into your office. I'm a potential acquiring company. And I ask you for some advice. I'm targeting this company. And should I buy the company? 
You think it's a good idea? What are the two possible answers? Yes and no. Let's carry this through. If you say yes, then I'm going to run with it and do the acquisition. And you're going to make $100 million or $50 million. If I say no, what happens? I don't do the deal. And you get the everlasting gratitude of my shareholders by try paying bonuses with that one. So guess what kind of answer you're going to give me? Asking a banker whether a deal makes sense. You might have heard this in my corporate finance class, might as well say it. It's like asking a plastic surgeon whether there's something wrong with your face. <laughs> right? What are you going to get as an answer? You're already perfect. <laughs> but it's not the banker's fault. I tell people, if you go to an electronic store and ask the salesman, what's the best TV for me? You know what you're going to come home with? A 75-inch flat pl you know, plasma TV that cost you 15000 Why? Because the commission on the TV was $4,000. The fact that you have a studio apartment and can't get it in there <laughs> is not his problem. You go back and complain. He says, just hang it up outside the window. Look out of your window. At the <laughs> he doesn't care. But then if you come to me and say, that, ter that salesman is terrible. He didn't sell me the right TV. You know what my answer to you is going to be? It's your money. And you need to do your homework. So when CFO said, oh, Goldman Sachs told me to do the acquisition, and that's why I overpaid. Makes no sense to me. So if you're an M&A analyst working for, a, let's say you work for the, for the acquiring firm, and it's, it's going to get really, really difficult here to keep the bias kind of balanced. You're an M&A analyst. You're working for the banker, no, I'm sorry, for the acquirer in a friendly takeover. What happens in a friendly takeover? There are two companies. Everybody, you know, you were the Hamilton, I was in the, you know, you know, you know the song, right? In the room where it happens. You, let's say you're in the room where it happens. It's a friendly merger. There's the acquiring company CEO. There's a target company CEO. The acquiring company's banker. There's a target company banker. Who in that room does not want the deal to go through? Right? Everybody in the room basically, the deal wants to. It's a friendly merger. So if you're the banker of the acquiring company and ask you to value the target firm, are you gonna, is your bias to come up with a high value? What's your job? It's your job to show the acquiring company shareholders they're getting a good deal, right? And what's the essence of a good deal? That the value of the target company is higher than the price you're paying, so you're going to push the value up. But if I'm the banker in the same room working for the target company, I have the exact opposite objective, right? I have to go to my shareholders and show them what? That the price is not lower than the value because they're going to say, why are you selling it at a bargain then? So my job with the same company is to show the value. How the heck do they pull that off? Same company, same point in time. You know how you do it? This is the magic of synergy. Because <laughs> it's like this, let's add this half a billion. You take 300 million, I'll take 200 million. We're both now OK. Now do you see why synergy becomes this buzzword in mergers? And if you're Looking at a hostile acquisition, think of what's different. In a hostile acquisition, the acquiring company's bankers, or the target company bankers, want to show the deal doesn't make sense. And the acquiring company bankers, especially if they want to play this game, will, do two, will have to do two valuations. One, to convince their stockholders, that do, get their stockholders they're getting a good deal, and the target company's stockholders that they're also getting a good deal. Now do you see why M&A bankers get paid a lot? It's not because of your valuation skills, it's because you can do valuation acrobatics where you can have each group and essentially be able to take the same company and frame it away that every group walks away saying, that made sense. Here's my advice, and this is something we'll talk about. When you sit down to value a company, don't try to make yourself unbiased. It's impossible to do. <coughs> All you can do be open about your bias. In statistics, there's a branch of statistics called Bayesian statistics. If you're familiar with it in Bayesian statistics, here's what you're required to do. You're supposed to state your priors before you show me what you found in your study. So let's suppose that you are a you know, health researcher and you're studying whether drinking a lot of beer affects your GPA. At in college. So that's your prior that will go up. So that, let's say my prior is 
If you drink a lot, your GPA is going to be in the toilet. So I'm going to say up front, that's what I expect to find. Then I show you the results of my study. You're saying, how is it going to be helpful? Let's say you're reading the study. You see my priors. I expected to find that people who drink a lot have low GPAs. I find the same thing in my study. You shouldn't throw it away, but you should discount it because I'm confirming my biases. The most powerful valuations occur when you walk in thinking you're going to find something undervalued and you find them to be overvalued. So when that happens, don't fight it because in a sense, that is why we do valuation. So be open about your biases and let's, be, let's not try to hide them. Even if you're going to lie to everybody around you, your boss, your colleagues, your clients, don't lie to yourself because valuation, that, that is what gets in the way. So if you start lying to say, look, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not being biased, I'm being objective, it's going to get you into trouble because there's real money behind that bias now. So let's, now, now you can open up the intro to valuation that you actually picked up because... So when I first started teaching valuation, I made the mistake of assuming that everybody else was as interested in valuation as I was. I discovered very quickly that this wasn't true, that most people don't care about value. They might go through the mechanics of valuing companies, but their heart's not in it. If I didn't believe in valuation, I wouldn't teach this class. So I'm going to tell you first why I do valuation. I do valuation to fight the lemming in me. You familiar with lemmings? Lemmings became famous or infamous in the 1950s when National Geographic or Disney, the, the, nobody's quite sure who did this first, made a film where they filmed the most amazing sight. Thousands of big, ugly, rat-like creatures, that's what lemmings look like, gathered together on a cliff, ran right off the cliff into an ocean and committed collective suicide. And ever since, one of the big questions has been, why do they do it? What drives them off the cliff? I don't know the answer to that question, but let's do some virtual imagery. You can see why the first lemming did it, right? He was going too fast, he couldn't stop, off the cliff, into the ocean, no, dead. Second lemming, too close to the first guy, also in the ocean, dead. But put yourself in the shoes of the very last lemming, I know lemmings don't wear shoes, but kind of hang in there with the analogy anyway, of the very last lemming in the group. You're running as fast as you can towards a cliff. Your entire tribe has disappeared off that cliff. I would think you'd have second thoughts about what you were just planning to do, right? Left brain, right brain, whatever parts are, I should stop, stop. And then you hear this voice in the back of your head. You know what it's saying? They must know something that I don't. Remember those seven words, the seven most deadly words in investing in valuation. You hear it all the time. You sit down to value Tesla, you come up with $200 per share. You hear the voice in the back of it, they must know something that I don't. It speaks in a monotone, don't ask me why. And when you hear that voice, magical things will start to happen to your valuation. Like what? Your growth rates will go up, your margins will get higher, your cost of capital will get lower, 200 will become 300, 400. Don't fight it. There's a lemming inside each and every one of you dying to get out. In fact, you can divide the whole world of investors into three groups of lemmings. The first... I call proud lemmings. I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. They call themselves momentum investors, but it's pretty much the same thing, right? You see a group you join and you're buying, I'm buying. You're selling, I'm selling. Why are you buying? I don't care. The second group of lemmings I call Yogi Bear lemmings. I don't know whether you've ever read Yogi Bear comics, but you're smarter than the average bear. Yogi Bear lemmings think they're smarter than the average lemming. They want to run all the way up to the edge of the cliff in the last moment we are away. I can't pull off being a proud lemming. I am not smarter than the other. I have no idea where the cliff is coming. So even if I thought Tesla was overvalued, and he said, when is the correction coming? I have absolutely no idea and I have no qualms about admitting to it. If you ask me to describe myself, that's me, a lemming with a life vest. That's basically all that valuation can offer you is a life vest. Let me explain why. When you do valuation, trying to estimate cash flows and fundamentals for a company, basically that's your life vest. Because even if everybody else changes their mind, let's say you buy Levi Strauss because of the cash flows, and for whatever reason, momentum goes against the stock, the stock goes to eight, no, 12, then 11, then 10, at least technically you can say, that's okay because I still have the cash flows. It's small consolation, 
But I do valuation to fight the lemming in me. It slows the process down. It gives my rational side a chance to mount an argument. And perhaps, perhaps I can listen to that side once in a while. So let's look at three broad misconceptions. But the first one I've talked about already. All valuations are biased. Don't fight it. The question is, how much is the bias? The second big misconception about valuation is, if I do good valuation, I'll get the right answer. You know when this gets started? Very early in life. Kindergarten, maybe. Teacher puts 2 plus 3 in front of you. You come up with 5. She pats you on the back and says, right answer, good. And if you get any other answer, you say, the answer is wrong, go check what you did. So you're taught that if you do things right, you get the right answer. If you got the wrong answer, you must have done something wrong. And God help you if you're a numbers person who gets a numbers degree, because this gets reinforced over and over and over again. If you do things right, you get the right answer. And if you got the wrong answer, something must be wrong. I've been teaching this class, as you know, a long time. And I can predict like clockwork what's going to happen around the 11th or 12th week of this class. It's always happened. About 20 or 25 of you, mostly engineers, mathematicians, scientists, numbers people, will show up in my office with the valuation all done. Your type A personalities. You're going to put the valuation down on my desk and say, can you check this valuation and tell me whether I got the right answer? <laughs> and I'm not even going to look at the valuation. I'm going to push it across the desk to you and say, I don't know what the right answer is. And your faith in the system is going to crack. <laughs> so you're teaching this class. You don't know what the value of the co every company is. If I knew the value of every company, why would I be teaching this class? Think about it for a moment. And when I say that, what, you know, the group splinters. One half cannot handle the fact that there is no right answer. So you know what happens to them? They become fixed income people. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. It's so much more comfortable sitting there with a bond, right? The maturity is given. The coupon is given. You don't have to worry about margins and market shares. I let them go. It's a healthy recognition early on as to where you should live. The other half says, this is kind of fun. If you don't know what the right answer is, I can never, ever conclusively be wrong. <laughs> Think about it. How the heck do you show somebody that they're wrong? I ask you to buy a stock. It goes down 30 years in a row. You come to me and say, what the heck did you do? Why do you make me buy the stock? And I tell you, not a long enough time horizon. My buy recommendation on Lehman in 2007 would be looking really good today if the system had not shut them down. I think it's kind of fun not having the right answer. But it, psychologically, for some people, it's a struggle. And I'll, show you, I'll tell you when it's going to show up. When you're done with your valuation in week 13, week 10, week 11, you're going to look at that value. And you know the question you're going to ask? How do I know this is right? And some of you are going to take the next step and email and say, oh, is this right? And I'll save you the trouble. You are wrong. You're definitely wrong. You're 100% wrong. It's OK. It's not your fault. Move on. But that's psychologically a barrier you've got to get over if you're used to right answers. And the more numbers driven you are, you know, last session I talked about number crunches and storytellers. I'll tell you the end game for this class is if you're a number cruncher, I hope by the end of this class, you're willing to live with ambiguous answers. I'm, you're willing to let your imagination go right. To me, the essence of somebody who's good at valuation is either you're an imaginative slash creative number cruncher, or you're a disciplined storyteller, that you've learned enough comfort with the numbers that you learned how to use the numbers to get that comfort. Don't look for precision. It's not going to be there. You know why? Because you're not God. If you've been operating under the delusion that this class can't fix it, you're not God. You're predicting the future. Of course you're going to be wrong. Yes? So if, if, I wanna, if I'm going to become a storyteller. Without the numbers or with the numbers? Don't just become a story. Regardless, is it going to be more of a fiction writer or non-fiction? So Can you? Writing? That's the part that hopefully this class will give you if you're a storyteller. Because if you just are a storyteller, there are no bounds, right? You can cross lines. You can create three-headed dogs. You can create you know, Harry Potter. You can create all this. I mean, you can do whatever you want. But if you're a business, there are some stories which are fantasies. 
So what you need is enough comfort with the numbers that you know when your story is wandering off the track. So that's what I mean by discipline. Storytellers, is that's what gives you the discipline, is that comfort with numbers. Now let me follow up on this precision process because it's something like you'll, you'll struggle with. Not all companies make you equally uncomfortable. Some companies are easier to value than others, right? Levi Strauss is easier to value than left. Why? Because we know what Levi Strauss does. We have a business model. We can do forecasting. The payoff to doing valuation is greatest when you feel most uncertain. So when you sit there saying, I am really making up crap here. I really don't know what's going to happen. You do feel the urge to abandon, saying, look, this is too much uncertainty. That's when you should kind of hang in there and finish your valuation, because most people are going to give up. The payoff to doing valuation is greatest when it's darkest. That's why I asked you to pick companies and go where it's darkest, because that's where the payoff is going to be greatest. This brings me to my third and final misconception about valuation. If I make my model bigger, it's going to get better. You know what? It's getting so easy to build big models now, right? My first valuation I did with a calculator and a ledger sheet. Most of you are too young. You've never seen a ledger sheet. You know what the great innovation in the ledger sheet was? The lines came pre-drawn, which for me was a huge plus because I could never get the right line straight. So I could draw t the 10 columns were already there. I said, this is so good. But when you build a spreadsheet with a calculator and a ledger sheet, you're limited in the line items you're going to have, right? You're going to have, not going to have 500 line items because every single cell you got to compute by hand. There used to be natural limits on how much detail you added. Today, not only can you create Excel spreadsheets, you can create macros on top of macros. And God help you if there's a team in the basement of your company whose job it is to build models for you. You know what I'm talking about, the geek squad? They come in, they go to the basement, I don't know why, they can't see the light of day or they turn into vampires or something. And they love building models, and these models get bigger and bigger. More inputs come in, they never leave. So to value a company, you get 15, 20, 20, and before you know it, 100 inputs to value one company. Then they slap a name on this model, they send it up to your desk and say, from this day on, when you value companies, use our in-house model. Two things happen with these models. One is what I call input fatigue. You know what input fatigue is? I'll describe it, and you tell me if you worked at a bank or a consulting firm whether you had this. It'll usually hit you around 10 p.m. on a Saturday night, and you're still at your desk. You think you're done for the week. You get ready to turn things off and leave when your boss, who's a complete jerk, shows up, throws an annual report on your desk, and says, I want this company valued first thing tomorrow morning. It's this trial by fire. You want to see how much you really want your job. Part of you wants to exercise your option to abandon. I don't describe it. It's deeply satisfying when you exercise it, but they're deeply. It's usually taking the form of the 10 k uh, the annual report, picking it up and throwing it back in your boss. And you do it yourself. The moment it leaves your hand is the deeply satisfying. And then after that, it's all downhill. You think about it for a second, and then you remember the rent, the car payment, the student loans, and you say, OK. And you sit down to value a company with your in-house model. You work carefully, input by input. You use references. You check the data. Clock strikes midnight. You're not Cinderella. You look down. You're at the 12th input. There are 88 more inputs to go. Your stomach drops. You look at the 13th input. It says, what was the inventory five years ago? Part of you wants to go look it up, but it's too exhausted to get out of the chair. The other part of you prompts, enter a random number. Let's move on. <laughs> it's amazing how scary it is, because you just enter. And the scary thing is the output comes out. It all looks the same, right? The number you thought three hours about, the number you made up on the spur of the moment. And I'll let you in on another little secret in valuation. If you're doing a valuation with a lot of random number inputs, you know how you hide it? Create more detail in your output. If you have 500 line items, nobody will have any idea what's random, what's not. If I create worksheets that connect to each other, nobody ever checks anyway, right? Input fatigue. The second is the model becomes a black box. I remember a JP Morgan equity research report from a long time ago. 
where the analyst had put a, you know, was, was looking at a company that was familiar with, put a target price of 85, the stock was at 35. I called the analyst and I said, how do you come up with this 85? Why do you like the company so much? He said, I didn't do it. I said, what? Your name's on the report. It says $85 there. He said, I didn't do it. I said, who did it? He said, Value Mac did it. I said, who the hell is Value Mac? He said, that's our in-house valuation model. I said, what did you do, sneak into your office in the middle of the night, value the company, and leave it on your desk? But you know the signal you were sending me, right? Look, this is a really complicated model. I entered the numbers, and something happened in there. $85 popped out. You know what the dead giveaway when this is happening is? When the report comes out, the analyst will not say, I valued the company at. He will say, the model valued the company at. So let's make a deal right now. You're allowed to download any spreadsheet you want on my website. You can adapt it, use it as is, on one condition. When your final report comes in, in other words, I do not want to see, the Demodoran model or your model valued the company at. Because you know what you're trying to do. It's not my fault. You did it. <laughs> Complexity has a cost. You know why? Because each layer you add, you've got to estimate the numbers. Less is more. In fact, in the physical science, there's a principle called the principle of parsimony, which means if you're trying to explain a phenomenon, start with the simplest explanation before you create new dimensions. Adopt the same practice in valuation. You're trying to value something, ask yourself, what's the simplest model? Like, I'm not saying you shouldn't build detail, but build it only if you need it. And I'll give you a very simple example of the kinds of details I'm talking about. In 35 years of valuation, perhaps more, I, when you do cash flows for a company, you start with earnings, you subtract out net capex, okay, you know, and then you subtract out change in working capital. Why? Because it makes accrual into cash. We do that all the time. In 35 years of valuation, I've never in my life, or in, in evaluation, broken the working capital down into its constituent parts. You know what I'm talking about? Inventory. You know why? I'm incapable of forecasting days of inventory for the next 30 years. If you have the power, I am in awe. But if I can't do it, what's the point of breaking things down if you're bringing nothing to the process? And the more uncertain I get, the less detail there is. So that's why in the Tesla valuation, if you look, I subtract out reinvestment. What's in there? There's net capex, there's working capital, there's acquisitions, there's R&D. Why aren't you breaking down? I don't know where they will be reinvesting. Elon Musk doesn't know where they'll be reinvesting. Why break down things if you don't have the details? You can mangle some really simple assets using complex models. In fact, when you value a company, and you look at the balance sheet, and you look at all these assets, what's the easiest or simplest asset on a balance sheet to value? It should be right there. Cash, right? You won't believe this, but every week I get at least a half a dozen emails from people claiming to have built a better model to value cash. Okay, Professor Deodorant, Demodorant, whatever, you know, spell check. I've, you know, I've spent the last six months of my life building this model to value cash, to which my response is, what an empty life you must have. Could you take a look at the attached Excel spreadsheet? I never opened the attached Excel spreadsheet because I programmed my F7 key on my laptop to respond. You know what it says? Have you tried counting it? It usually works with cash. Because <laughs> if you build a model to value cash, here's what's going to happen. Let's say you take a company like Google, $100 billion in cash, actually $120 billion. When you see cash in marketable securities in a US or a European company, where is it invested? It has to be invested in something close to riskless and very liquid. So if you invest in bonds, you can't put into cash and marketable securities because there's, there's that risk that price could change. So if you have $120 billion in Google invested in tables and commercial paper, what kind of return do you think they're making right now on that? Maybe one, one and a half percent, because that's the table rate. So you have $120 billion. So let's say you project, and this is where the Pavlovian response kicks in, the one that you go to business school to acquire. To so value something, what do you do? You project the income from it. So you sit there and you project the income from the cash, 1% every year for the next 10 years. And then all is lost because to discount that future number, what do you need? You need a discount rate. 
thank God I spent $200,000 to go to Stern and I know how to compute betas and cost of equity. You go to work and six hours later, you got a cost of cap of a Google of 9%. $200,000 is really paying off. And you discount the income back at 9%. Let me ask you a question. You take $120 billion invested risklessly, making 1% a year, and you discount that income back at 9%. What's going to happen to the $120 billion? It's going to become like $80 billion. You didn't realize it was that easy to wipe out cash, right? You're saying, I would never do something that stupid. You know what? If you ever compute cash flow starting with net income, it's an equity income, and you come up with cash flows, and you discount them at the cost of equity. Remember, interest income is part of net income, and you discount it back at the cost of equity. You're doing exactly what I described in the background. Don't go looking for trouble. Look for the simplest platform to value something before you move on. So I'm going to just call this my Bermuda Triangle evaluation. Three sides of it. There's bias, there's complexity, there's uncertainty. And the reason I call it the Bermuda Triangle is I know it's mythical in the Atlantic and ships disappear. This is where good sense disappears. So when you're struggling with the evaluation, you're thinking about the details, step back and think about the bias, the complexity, the uncertainty, because that's often what makes your evaluations go off the tracks. So I'm going to lay out three basic approaches to valuation, and at least look at it from a big picture perspective. When I give you a business or an asset to value, you can do an intrinsic valuation of the company, which means you look at the value based on its cash flows, growth, and risk. Discounted cash flow valuation might be the tool you use, but in intrinsic value, the value for something is based on its fundamentals. That's approach one. The second is you can put a number to that same asset or company based on what other people are paying for similar companies. We describe this as pricing. And the only part of valuation that is presumably new or different is we've been able to use option pricing to value certain kinds of businesses, young pharma company and natural resource company. But every valuation model anywhere in the world has to fall into one of these three buckets. Some are screwed up because they fall, try to fall into multiple buckets. Intrinsic valuation, pricing, or real, the last category is called real options. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about each of these approaches, at least in a very broad sense. But before I do that, remember, with all three approaches, you're starting with a presumption. You know what the presumption is? Markets make mistakes. If you believe that markets don't make mistakes, you should drop this class right now. Because what's the value of Tesla? $913.53, whatever the market price is, right? The very fact that you're sitting down to do evaluation must suggest that you... So one of the things I want to talk about is what kind of market mistake are you assuming with each of these approaches? And what are you assuming about how markets correct their mistakes? You're going to see you have to make assumptions about both. Because just assuming market make mistakes is not going to make you money. It's a correction that gives you the money. So let's start with intrinsic valuation. In intrinsic valuation, or discounted cash flow valuation, the most common tool, you basically say the value of a business is the present value of the expected cash flows in the business. It's like very first class you ever take in finance, playing out over and over and over again. It's like Groundhog Day. And in intrinsic valuation, you start with a philosophical view that every cash flow generating asset has a value and that you will be able to find it. It's like a little bit like the search for the Holy Grail. Who found the Holy Grail? I think Indiana Jones came really close. <laughs> but nobody's found it. The same thing is true for intrinsic value. You keep looking, and you keep looking, but you keep the faith. It's there. I'll keep trying. And if you break down discounted cash flow models down, they have the three ingredients. You're going to have cash flows, obviously. You're going to have a discount rate, and you're going to have a like for the asset. So what kind of market mistakes are you assuming when you use intrinsic valuation as the basis for investing? First. You assume that markets make mistakes on individual stocks and how they price them. Second, you assume you can find those mistakes with your metrics and models, and now you're on dangerous ground. Because the first assumption is an easy one. Even people who believe in efficient markets believe markets make mistakes. It's the second one where efficient market people deviate from the rest of us. You believe you can find. But third, you also have to assume that markets correct their mistakes. Because if they don't correct their mistakes, you're never going to make money on intrinsic valuation. And therein lies the frustration and the challenge in intrinsic valuation. You see what the frustration is? You value a company at 50, you go buy it at 35. And you're trying to get 
you, you make money only if the 35 goes to 50. How the heck do you get markets to correct their mistakes? You could go on some Reddit message board and keep posting, you know, XYZ companies cheap, XYZ. Nobody's reading you anyway. But the reality is out of your control. You think if I wait long enough, isn't it guaranteed? Nothing is guaranteed. You could wait 50 years and it's still mispriced. This isn't fixed income. Fixed income, there's a reason why you can do fixed income arbitrage. Why? If you have a mispriced bond, what has to happen? As you approach the maturity date, the mispricing has to go away. That's why you can, the equity arbitrage is an oxymoron. You can buy, some, it's, I call it informed speculation, if you want a nice word for it. You cannot do equity arbitrage because there's no day of reckoning. So I'm going to give, talk a little bit about the advantage and disadvantage. You're going to see this play out. What are the advantages of discarded cash flow valuation? Well, if you do it right, it should be less exposed to market moods and momentum. So you're saying, why is that a good thing? Well, markets can be, you know, crowds have wisdom, but crowds can also go mad. One of my favorite books is a very old book called The Madness of Crowds, the late 1800s. And it talks about the South Sea bubble and the tulip craze. But then basically, as you describe, you see the play out. So if you don't trust crowds to make the right judgment, hey, intrinsic valuation is for you. And if you're a Buffett follower, one of the things that Buffett has always said is he doesn't buy shares in a company, he buys a piece of a business. If you truly believe that, intrinsic valuation should be the tool used because you're valuing the business. It forces you to understand the business. You cannot value Tesla without looking at what do tip auto companies typically make in margins. No, in a sense, it forces you to get into the details. And, if, and that's a good thing, right? You understand the business before you. And to the extent that you're this very unusual person who doesn't care what the market is doing. And that's un you can see why it's unusual, right? Because a lot of intrinsic value people say, look, as long as I collect the cash flows, why should I care what the market price is? I would love to tell you that I don't care what the market price is. But once a week when I check my portfolio, I see it. And it bugs me. Even if I'm collecting the cash flows, I might buy a stock for a 4% dividend. I might collect the dividend, but if the stock drops 20%, even if I plan to hold it, what? The, the total portfolio I see is smaller than it was. But it, you could argue that perhaps if you can just look at the cash flows, you could say, I don't care what the price is. What are the disadvantages? Well, it's a lot more work than doing a pricing. You have to understand the company. You're going to understand the business. So it is a lot more work. And as you can see, you can manipulate those numbers to deliver a result if you're biased enough. And in intrinsic valuation, there is no guarantee that you will ever find something to be cheap. So let's say you're the auto analyst. Or let's, let's make it different. Let's, make, let's say you're the social, oh, oh, Beyond Meat is, what category would you give Beyond Meat? It's actually a category of two. It's Impossible Foods or Beyond Meat. Beyond Meat or Impossible Foods. Okay. Let's say your job is to tell me which one is cheap. And you do intrinsic valuations of both. Is it possible that both could be overvalued? Yeah, in intrinsic valuation, both could be overvalued. And if you're an equity research analyst, what are you going to do? Sell, sell. Two months later, sell, sell. Two months later, sell, sell. The next month, you're going to be fired. You can't keep sending sell, 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 because you know, it's not interesting. And if your job is to have to buy equities. You're you know, fidelity. You're an equity mutual fund manager. What's your job? To be 100% or close to the investment equities. Which means you've got to find under stocks to buy. And if you're a true believer in intrinsic value, you might find nothing. So what could you do? You could liquidate the fund and send the money back. Don't do that as a fidelity manager. That will, you know, you're not only will you get into trouble, you know, you'll probably be fired right afterwards. But that's exactly what Warren Buffett did in 1969. He used to run essentially the equivalent of a private equity fund. 69 stock prices were soaring. And in perhaps the most read letter of all time, if you get good on Google search, you can find the original letter. Right? He actually liquidated the fund, and he sent a letter that is the basis for his legend. He said, look, at current stock prices, I can do one of two things. I can bend my principles and find things to buy, but I'll be giving up on my principles. Or 
I'll do the right thing, which is given the way I think about value, everything looks too expensive. I'm sending the money back. How many people have that much power in their hands, right? And even if you did, do you want to carry that through? Because your wealth is tied to how much money you manage, you make a percent of the money. So it's easy to talk valuation, but then as markets keep going up, you might find yourself pricing things because that's the only way you can find things to buy. So when will discounted cash flow valuation work for you? First, discounted cash flow valuation, and the risk of stating the obvious, I might as well state it, can be used only to value assets that have cash flows. So what can you not value? You cannot value gold. You cannot value Bitcoin. You, can, you say, what do I do? You can price them still. We'll talk about pricing them. If your asset doesn't have cash flows, you can't value a Picasso. You can price a Picasso based on what other people are paying, but you need cash flows with assets. The assets don't have to be po the cash flows don't have to be positive. Your money losing companies still have cash flows. And the types of people for whom discounted cash flow valuation works best is first, it's nice if you can have a long time horizon. Why? Because markets have to correct their mistakes. The chances of that happening get greater if you have a 10-year horizon rather than a six-month. Already you can see why if you're a fidelity manager and Morningstar keeps rating you every six months based on what have you done for me lately, you might be a true believer in intrinsic value, but you're going to have mixed feelings about using it. And it'd be really nice if you could be the catalyst that causes the 35 to go to 50. That sounds magical, right? You buy a stock, it's undervalued, and then you actually have some power to move the price. This is the power that activist investors have that makes it a little easier for them to make money. You're a Carl Icahn. You take a large position in a stock. Right after you take that large position, what does Carl do? He goes up on CNBC. What does he say? I bought Apple, you should too. Now, if you or I walk up and say, hey, you should buy Apple, nobody's listening, but Carl Icahn says it, he's got $2 billion. That is a benefit that activist investors have that gives them a little edge. It doesn't guarantee anything. Bill Ackman, in fact, the, one, of, one of the most fascinating stocks that I've followed over the last year is Herbalife. We had two activist investors on either side of the spectrum. You had Bill Ackman saying it's a scam, and it was the most fun I had for a while. Because I no, don't particularly like either person, you know, but basically you could see the, the game play out. Now, when we talk about pricing, let's break it down. Pricing, you're trying to attach a number to an asset based on what other people are paying for similar assets. You've given up on the notion of intrinsic value. So we ask a trader, what's the true value of a company? And what his reaction is, who cares? I buy low, I sell high, I make money. Who cares what the intrinsic value is? Uh, on CNBC, I get on, I, sometimes I don't even know which program I'm on. My favorite show, to be honest, Fast Money. And Fast Money, it's me and four traders. You know why I like it? Because they're completely open about their contempt for intrinsic value. They say, look, I'm, we're traders. Who the hell cares what your intrinsic value is? I prefer that than a value investor who trades, but acts like I care about value, I do valuation. You don't care about intrinsic value because that's not the game you play. And if you break pricing down, here's what you're going to see. You're either going to see something that looks just like your company, which is almost impossible to do, or a group of companies that are like your company. You're going to see a standardized price because you can't compare price per share across companies. And you're going to see a story to control for difference, a higher growth, lower risk, etc. And in pricing, what kind of mistakes are you assuming markets make? You assume that markets are right on average, but they make mistakes on individual companies. In other words, you're assuming markets correctly price you know, social media companies, but they're underpricing Facebook. But there is an advantage you have over intrinsic valuation people. Let's suppose you buy a steel company because it's trading at eight times earnings and all the other steel companies trade at 20 times earnings. That mistake sticks out like a sore thumb, right? Unlike intrinsic value, where it's just your number, pricing mistakes are much more transparent. And because they're more transparent, they're more likely to be corrected quickly rather than over time, which means if you have a short time horizon, pricing works better for you because you get the correction happen sooner. So if you think about the advantages of pricing, one, you're much more in sync with the market. 
which if you're an equity mutual fund manager, you're an equity research analyst, that's your job. It's your job to kind of stay in there with the market because you have to be invested in equities. It is a lot less work than discounted cash flow valuation. At least on the surface, it looks like you don't have to make assumptions about risk and cash flows and growth. Somebody pricing Tesla right now doesn't have to deal with what's your auto business, will it be? Basically, you are making a pricing judgment with a lot less information. I'm going to argue that that's a bit of a misconception, that hidden behind your assumptions are assumptions about cash flows, growth, and risk, but at least explicitly you're not making it. And in pricing, you're playing what I call the incremental game, which is pricing is moved by what the next piece of information. It could be a tiny, trivial piece of information, but that's what drives whether you make money or not. So that earnings report could be a make or break for you because if you get that earnings report, you know, whether it's going to be a positive or a negative surprise, right? Who the heck cares what the intrinsic value is? You're going to make money in the week after the earnings report and make a lot of money. So anybody who predicted that Tesla's earnings last Wednesday were going to be better than expected, it doesn't matter what the intrinsic value is, is going to be substantially rich, almost doubled your money in a week. And if you think about the disadvantages, so you'll notice that whatever made were advantage for DC have become disadvantages of pricing, and the reverse is true. And the disadvantage of pricing is when you tell me something is underpriced. You're an equity research analyst and this is a buy. Even if you're a good equity research analyst, you know what I need to keep in mind? It is a buy relative to the other 11 companies you compare to. You're making a pricing judgment. So just because you find something to be underpriced doesn't make it undervalued. So you know what? You want to see Beyond Meat and see if it's a, you know, Impossible Foods looks cheap to me. Why? Relative to Beyond Meats, Impossible Foods is cheap. They both will be overvalued, but if you have to pick one in pricing, you will always find you know, in the, that, that there, are, there are equities that come through as underpriced. And as I said, even though you don't make explicit assumptions about cash flow, growth, and risk, you make implicit assumptions. And they can get you into trouble because you don't even know what you're assuming about future growth when you go out and buy Tesla. Which brings me to when pricing is going to work best for you. Pricing works best for assets but there are lots of other assets just like your asset. That's why StubHub is so easy to use, right? You want to buy a seat in section 302 to decide what a fair price is. What do you do? You check other seats in that same section. In fact, if, you're a, if you use SeatGeek, which is a kind of an aggregator, they actually take all of the seat deals and they break them around to great deals, good deals. Take a look at how, you think that's, so, that's so incredibly sophisticated. How the heck did they do it? You know what they do, right? They compare the price you're asking for a seat to the average price of other people in the same section asking for seats. And if you're asking 30% less, hey, great deal. If it's only 20% less, good deal. You ask 20% more, it's a bad deal. It's, it's actually, and it works because you have laws. Whereas if I ask you to price a Picasso, the problem you're going to face? There are thousands of Picassos floating around. There might be, what, 30? And not all of them are you know, bought and sold. You're then stretching the definition of pricing. Because, and that's why if you look at Sotheby's or Christie's, they have to pay an appraiser 15% or 10% of this absurd price to put a number on it because the pricing is much more difficult. And what kinds of investors are best suited for pricing? Let's say you're really good at pricing things. You know what's overpriced, you're not, you know, you're not very good at level, but you get the pricing right. So let's take Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods, and let's say your pricing is that Beyond Meat is overpriced and Impossible Foods is underpriced relative to each other, and you're right about your judgment. What are you not controlling? Both companies could be over, you know, overvalued, right? So they could, you know, there could be a big correction. But if you're correct on your pricing, what if you could buy Impossible Foods and sell short on Beyond Meat? Because you don't need to be right about level then. As long as they move back towards where you think they should be, you're going to make money. This is the advantage that a hedge fund has over Fidelity, right? Mutual funds are long only. Hedge funds can go long or short to the extent that you're taking advantage of pricing from both directions and you're right about your pricing, it gets easier to make money. I know we have only one minute left, but let me list out one final page, and then we'll finish off for the day. 
Now, the last 10 years, we asked me, what is the one item that I keep getting asked to make a judgment on? Is it undervalued or overvalued? It's easy. It's Bitcoin. This is the most over-talked about investment in history. And here's why. What's the collective market cap of all of the cryptocurrencies put together right now? It's about 200 billion. How much cash balance does Apple have right now? 250 billion. Collectively, Ether, all of these Ripple, Bitcoin put together are worth less than one company's cash balance. Take a look at how much has been written and talked about this non-investment. And of course, it's caught people's imagination. You talk to people, how you invest in